good evening to everybody in India. Good morning to the guys in the US. This is Dr. Dhairishil Savan, the current secretary of the Indian Society of Oncology. We welcome you to uh, this webinar on COVID-19 and oncology. Uh, just let to give you an idea of who both these organizations are, the Indian Society of Oncology is the largest uh, society of oncologists, which include the surgical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, and uh, the medical oncologists, along with the pathologists. Anybody who deals in oncology is part of the Indian Society of Oncology. And we are proud to have over 2,500 to around 3,000 members. And we do a lot of uh, meetings and, uh, and do a lot of work in oncology. So, but since uh, February, I would say, all of us have been um, hit by this new stuff called the COVID virus. And that has made uh, not only our friends and our patients and our people suffer, it also has made us a rethink, uh, to do a rethink on what to do in oncology. Obviously, oncology cannot be put aside. You say it's not emergent, you can't do that. But we need to come up now. We thought it's going to be a short term, but it's not going to be a long term. This is going to be a COVID era. It's going to last for the next six months, or at least the thought process is going to last longer than even six months. So one has to come up with ideas, with suggestions, with with uh, SOPs to do uh, in case of this, which is going to it is going to increase. Uh, what to do for radiation? What to do for surgery? What to do? Uh, for for chemotherapy, how do we change our protocols? Do we change our protocols? Um, do we change our surgeries? Do we change our radiation protocols? Uh, do we do robotics? Do we do laparoscopic? If so, if we do, what are the uh, safety measures to be approved, etc., so on and so forth. And it's a long list and uh, can take over a lot of webinars. So, uh, in short, uh, the that's what. We are, we are here to do the uh, the host organization which is there which is the inetsis which is i've been told is uh, an alliteration on infosys infosys was information technology this is international educational uh, technology systems uh, so i think uh, let's have more and more meetings with with people all over the world where we will be able to share our ideas share our concerns and share tips for, for each other. Maybe everybody's got something to learn, everybody's got something to give. So today, in uh, uh, in our um, um, webinar, we have a host of speakers. Uh, uh, one is a radiation oncologist, Dr. Bhupesh Parashar from, from US. He is a board certified radiation oncologist, professor and vice chair in the department uh, uh, of radiation oncology at Zucker School of Medicine at Hobstown Northwell Health in New York. Uh, he's right there in in the heat of stuff. Uh, he completed uh, his medical training from Molonaza in New Delhi, joined Albert Einstein School of Medicine in Bronx as a research fellow, and then did his radiation oncology. Uh, he was nominated as a chief resident, joint faculty at Weill Cornell Medical Center. Uh, he will discuss the radiation oncologist challenges. Dr. Rudra Acharya, a very close friend, uh, is the second speaker. He will talk on surgical challenges in cancer patients. Rudra has been a very uh, active uh, member and ingredient of all uh, the meetings in India. His, uh, his special interest in GI thoracic, urological oncology and sarcomas. In fact, he's got special interest in everything. Um, but he, he is a great leader. He's developed extensive expertise in laparoscopic and thoracoscopic uh, management, various tumors in GI thorax and urogenital limb salvage surgeries. Uh, he worked at GCRI, which is like the Tata Hospital, which I worked at. He's worked at the Gujarat Cancer Research Institute and is currently the Director of Thoracic Oncology, Minimal Access Oncology and Head of Department of Surgery at the Max Cancer Center in New Delhi. And the third speaker is Dr. Nagashri Setramo, uh, who is a Clinical Associate Professor in the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology uh, at the Department of Medicine at Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine, again at Hofstra Northwell, since 2015. She was faculty member at the New York University School of Medicine. She serves as an assistant program director for the Hematology and Medical Oncology Fellowship and an active member of the Thoracic Head and Neck Oncology team. So we have got a galaxy of speakers and I don't think I'm going to take more time and we should go ahead 
directly to the first speaker and i would like to ask uh, dr bhupesh parashar to take over the screen and uh, start bhupesh over to you And today we'll discuss uh, challenges faced by each of our specialties in cancer care. Uh, I'm going to start by discussing the general guidelines that we use for in the Department of Radiation Medicine. And then I'm going to talk about specific site specific uh, 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 procedures that we follow in our department. Uh, we are at the center of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and we are the, at the center of the epicenter, which is New York. So, and uh, and I think our experience is very relevant and it's helpful. So, so my topic is radiation therapy challenges during COVID-19 pandemic. So the general guidelines, when available, test the patient. So now testing is more common and available, and we are trying to do that. So test the patients and staff for coronavirus infection and exposure. For each patient, we are trying to do a multidisciplinary discussion before we initiate management or treatment. In radiation medicine, the general guideline is try to use shorter courses of radiation called hypofractionated radiation. Also, try to use smaller radiation fields when preferred to minimize uh, in radiation induced lymphopenia and to minimize toxicity. This is critical at this time. Consider enrollment in clinical trials to collect data and information in this cohort of patients. Consider enrollment into a clinical trial if infected with coronavirus. There are multiple trials going on in multiple institutions. And if your institution has a trial going, going on, try to enroll patients in that. In general, when you give radiation, uh, we follow these guidelines, but they have become very, very important at this time. Aggressive and preemptive, preemptive management of side effects, including early interventions such as skin creams, antidiarrheals, cough suppressants, anti-inflammatory and nutritional supplement. There should be a low threshold for hydration and pain management. There should be an enhanced communication with the team, including medical oncology, surgical oncology, nutrition, occupational health and physical therapy, social workers and wound care. The question is, does radiation impact immune system and should we be scared to even give radiation? In radiation medicine, we think uh, of systemic treatments as causing uh, generalized immune suppression, but the questions have been raised whether radiation does the same. Yes, it, it is immunosuppressive. However, given the focused nature of external beam radiation, especially with techniques like IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy or SBRT, which is stereotactic body radiation therapy. The quantitative effect of radiation on immune system is limited. However, if you use large radiation fields, for example, in palliative settings or you're treating a large part of spine or the bone, then obviously blood counts can be compromised and we should try to avoid that during this time. For curative treatments, the treatment should be prioritized based on tumor site, histology, performance status, and stage. These are the guidelines we follow at Northwell. And general ASCO and ASTRO guidelines are, if it's non-emergent treatment for early stage prostate or breast cancer, try to delay the treatment. But the decision should be based on multidisciplinary discussion with the entire team. This is a general guideline that we have come up with, uh, with in the department. This is a table that we have taken from a paper, departmental paper that was just accepted in advances in radiation oncology. So we divide patients in three priorities. We give them a priority number, priority one, two, and three. One is we, we cannot delay treatment too, uh, too long. So these are uh, emergencies, advanced head and neck cancers, advanced GI cancers advanced GYN and advanced lung cancer. So they all come in priority one. That means we plan and treat as we were doing before the pandemic happened as quickly as possible. 
Priority two is treating within four weeks. Uh, they can be delayed a little bit, not too long. Uh, early stage head and neck cancers, early stage lung cancers, lymphoma, brain cancers, SRS for benign disease. And priority three are patients who we think can be delayed longer than four weeks. Although each of these patients, when once we divide them into these priorities, we discuss them every other day to see if a patient has to be moved to an earlier priority. And priority three are early stage prostate cancers, breast cancer and or prostate cancers on uh, hormone therapies. And the general rule is if the risk of hospitalization is high, don't use a, a general standard approach. So in patients who ha have to have chemo radiation, try a sequential chemotherapy and radiation approach. Uh, talk to medical oncology and ask them if they can use a less toxic chemotherapy regimen or targeted therapy. And if we think that it's uh, the patients are still at risk of hospitalization, give radiation alone or, or use an altered fractionation. However, altered fractionation can itself be a problem because uh, uh, if you use BID fractionation, it can cause mycositis, which is which, which a problem. These are general guidelines we follow in for head and neck cancers. Uh, for example, if you look at column three, we, we do twice weekly uh, status check, which is some patients, we meet the patients twice a week rather than once a week, regular uh, CBC uh, by uh, radiation or medical oncologists, early use of pain management, uh, gabapentin, mouth rinses, nutritional supplements, dietary evaluations, and to avoid uh, hospitals, uh, manage dysphagia before it actually happens. IV fluids, uh, NG tube placement, if, if we think the patient may need a feeding tube, because even a PEG placement is a problem these days and, uh, and uh, the ORs are closed and, and patients can get them. There should be a low threshold to stop chemotherapy and there should be a low threshold to give a break, in fact, rather than putting the patient in the hospital because of toxicity, give a break and let the patient come back and recover. So for head and neck cancers, dental evaluation is very important and usually is performed. It's a standard procedure we follow. However, given the pandemic, we are not seeing the, the dentists are not able to see the patients and they can't even do much extractions or, or root canals or any procedures that they normally do. So in those situations, what we have to do is that the patients have to be made aware of the challenges in performing dental evaluation and then discuss the risk of osteonecrosis and worsening dentition. Dental guards can be used to reduce scatter and reduce toxicity, but the patients generally have to make a decision on whether they want to start treatment without a full dental evaluation or they want to wait for the dental uh, evaluation to be done. And as physicians, we have to guide them. If the patient is an older patient, unable to undergo surgery or full course of chemo radiation, try to use stereotactic radiation, 35 to 44 gray in five fractions, delivered every other day. It can be deliver, de delivered every day also, but usually for, I think for safety reasons, we I would do it every other day. For oral cavity cancers or paranasal sinus cancers, where surgery is the first, generally the first option, give preoperative radiation if surgery cannot be done. And that will act as a bridge to surgery. Uh, and preoperative radiation has been proven to be a, an option, a fair option in several trials, including an RTOG trial, which compared pre-op to post-op radiation. So use 50 grain, two gray per fraction and treat the primary site and, and the nodes. Generally well tolerated. If surgery has already been done, uh, give post-op radiation and uh, you can avoid chemotherapy if you want, if you think that the it's going to be too toxic. But if you do give radiation, it's 54 to 66 gray in 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. That's what we use and that's what NCCN also um, recommends. For thoracic cancers, there are four common types that we see. Early stage lung cancer, advanced stage lung cancer, small cell lung cancers and thymic tumors. General guidelines we follow is consider induction therapy uh, rather than concurrent chemo radiation therapy and uh, delay radiation if we think that there's not uh, a definite uh, evidence that radiation is gonna be beneficial, for example, in N2 non-small cell lung cancer. Evaluate the need for oxygen, twice a weekly uh, status checks when we see the patient in person, early use of steroids, PPIs, caraphate, pain medications. Basically manage esophagitis well and gabapentin and dietary evaluation and patients should be okay. These are the, these are the stereotactic body radiation therapy doses that we uh, 
are we commonly use. In our department, we use uh, 48 to 55 grain five fractions, but there is a, there is a more recent evidence to use one fraction uh, SBR, which is of around 34 grain. And that's an acceptable option. And to limit patient visits to the hospital, that's a good option. And we can use that for early stage lung cancers. For advanced stage lung cancers, as I said, you can use sequential chemo radiation if concurrent, which is a standard, is a problem. And uh, the doses are 60 to 70 gray in two gripper fraction. That's with or without chemotherapy. If you're using preoperative doses, thinking that the patient is going to get surgery later, use 45 to 54 gray in 1.8 to two gripper fraction. And for post-operative doses, generally, again, it's a controversial topic whether to use post-operative radi dose radiation for N2 disease. But if there is multi-level lymph node involvement, it's a good idea to do that. And uh, adding chemotherapy is not definite. Uh, it's beneficial. So you can do it in a sequential way rather than concurrent. For small cell lung cancers, again, as I said, sequential chemo and radiation you can use PCI for both extensive and limited stage disease. It's beneficial. It's low toxicity. Patients do well. And we can give like thoracic, even for extensive stage disease, we can give thoracic radiation, 30 grain, 10 fraction, which is a standard dose. It's a very well tolerated dose. For thymic tumors, surgery is the standard. If you cannot do it at this time, give preoperative radiation or chemo radiation. There are multiple papers for that. Use 40 to 45 grain, 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. And if you're giving, if the patient already had surgery, give uh, 45 to 50 gray for negative margins, 54 gray for positive margins, 60 to 70 gray for gross disease in 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. And these are NCCN recommended doses. For medically inoperable patients, use 60 to 70 gray in 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. And if you can't use it, try to use chemo radiation, but if you cannot, then just use radiation alone. For esophagus cancers, we, the standard is to give preoperative radiation anyway, uh, preoperative chemo radiation, in fact, and uh, as per the cross regimen, and the doses are 41, 40, or 250 gray. Uh, and if we can do it, if so, if now at this time I think some of the ORs are opening up, so I think we can start doing this. But if so, if surgeons are still hesitant, and if uh, hospital administration is not allowing surgery, give definitive uh, chemo radiation. If chemotherapy is not being planned concurrently, then escalate the dose of external beam radiation to 60 to 64 gray, and that's the right thing to do. For post-operative doses, use 45 to 50 gray and 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. For prostate cancers, uh, you know, traditionally we have been uh, treating these cancers for eight weeks, once a day, five days a week for eight weeks or nine weeks, and that may not be the best during COVID times. NCCN does recommend like five fraction treatment for low risk, very low risk, high risk. Look at this table. And if you look at the bottom uh, row, it's 7.25 to eight gray per fraction uh, for five fractions and the results are acceptable and good. So you should use a shorter course of radiation. It's a treatable cancer and you can use hormones uh, after that. In prostate cancer, the challenge is we commonly use this, there's something called the spacer, uh, which is a hydrogel, which is placed between prostate and rectum to minimize radiation dose to the rectum. And it's a minor surgical procedure where patients, this is done uh, in under anesthesia uh, or sedation. And in this day and age, uh, with everything being uh, rationed, so we don't have PPEs and we, we cannot do these hydrogels or fiducial marker placement in prostate. So you can do it without that. Most of the world is treating the prostate without that. Although what we would recommend is to do a daily cone beam CT or onboard imaging if you're not using a spacer or fiducials. For pancreatic cancer, use SPRT. Fantastic results in the last few years. It's been more commonly used. 8 to 12 gray per fraction, 5 to 8 uh, fractions. And uh, we commonly place fiducials. Uh, but if that's challenging, use MRI, CT, PET CT scan fusion, and then uh, do cone beam CT. However, sometimes cone beam CT can also be a delayed treatment. So other ways to shorten radiation times is by using manual breath hold with coaching or abdominal compression. For kidney cancers, this is some, something that generally radiation doctors don't see. It's a, sur a surgical field. However, uh, so if surgeons cannot operate at this time, send patients for stereotactic radiation. There's good evidence suggesting using stereotactic radiation, 26 grain, one fraction, or 14 grade, three fractions. These are all different doses that have been listed in this table. 
and I think the slides are available later and, and the results are optimal and good and potentially can be done uh, if surgery is not uh, available. Again, colon cancer, not a radiation uh, uh, cancer, generally a surgical case uh, and uh, surgery and chemotherapy. However, if surgery cannot be done, there is evidence suggesting use, using preoperative radiation as a bridge to surgery. Use 45 to 50 gray in 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction. If surgery is not being planned, then treat it like a definitive case and treat it to 54 or higher dose, but make sure that the abdominal organs, uh, the constraints are met. And using SBRT, which is a five fraction treatment, is there's not much data for colon cancer. However, there is a good amount of data for abdominal metastasis or so you can definitely give, uh, give it a shot, especially on a protocol if you can do it uh, in your department. Rectal cancers, usually we do preoperative uh, pre -operative radiation. The common fractionation we use is 25 grain, five fractions, and surgery within one week as per the Swedish protocol, or we can actually delay surgery by, by six to eight weeks, and that's all acceptable. If patients respond to chemo radiation, some of the patients may actually get a complete response. And if surgery cannot be done, basically we stop at that and then we uh, follow patients. Um, another option is to use regular fractionation, 45 grade to the pelvis, followed by 5.4 grade boost. And for unresectable cancer, basically use a definitive approach of chemo radiation. Anal cancer, standard treatment is concomitant chemo radiation. Protons may be used for, pa for places that have protons. Um, for patients that are elderly, uh, there are some studies suggesting using a sh shorter fractionation course, 30 gray and 15 fractions with concurrent FIBFU or, or Zeloda, and that is shown to have good results, especially in elderly patients. So these are options that we can use. These are obviously not the standard, but they can be used during COVID times. Breast cancer recommendations have been made recently by international collaborative group that includes hypofractionated regimen. Uh, you can use 28 to 30 gray once weekly fraction over five weeks or five daily fractions over one week. Omit boost in select patients. Omit nodes in select patients. Use moderate hypofractionation for post mastectomy patients like 40 gray and 15 fractions. And avoid radiation in older patients, uh, especially if ERPR positive or early stage breast cancer. So, that, so these are recommendations are absolutely valid during COVID times. And stress for stress reduction and burnout, everybody is anxious. Uh, there's a widespread panic and anxiety worldwide, including departments. So wellness sessions and techniques should be used to reduce stress amongst radiation staff and patients. And uh, th this can be done in person or online, preferably online these days. Staff should be made aware of the available mental support uh, resources within the institutions. And the patients and staff should have ready access to mental health services. At Northwell, they are doing a fantastic job. I got a call yesterday from a, from a professional uh, asking if I was feeling okay, and that's how it should be done for all patients and, and staff. Um, in conclusion, this current COVID-19 pandemic represents an unprecedented era in healthcare and has potential impact on cancer patients, lack of access to surgery and some systemic therapies impacts the ability to provide current standards of care. We must continue to care for patients during this time and reduce the potential stage migration and associated morbidity of delay treatment. These treatments that I just recommended are not considered a replacement of standard of care, but they are potential alternatives when other resources are constrained. Thank you. I'm now gonna hand the mic to Dr. Acharya. Greetings from India and uh, Indian Association of uh, 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 Indian Society of Oncology and uh, also Max Healthcare. So COVID-19 uh, has traveled 
from Wuhan to the most of the operation theaters throughout the world. And how did it ha happen? God only knows. So the surgical challenges in the cancer patient during COVID crisis is immense. Whether to operate or don't operate, you don't have a solution uh, definite uh, instantly. So you have to take a lot of things into consideration before preempting for a surgical uh, operation. So I will take you through the challenges that we are finding during the uh, COVID times. So COVID-19 is a familiar guest in most of the country, in most of the houses. And the virus journey from Wuhan lab to the operation the theaters is a big question. And the scare has created to the most of the operating staff in world's best operating theaters. And the cases are on rise in most of the uh, world, worldwide, more than 210 countries, and no definite treatment or vaccine till it available. So we have to deal it with it. And WHO has declared the pandemic, but the persons on the ground are the real people who are dealing as the uh, COVID warriors. Now, if you see the history of pandemics, so many pandemics has happened uh, before plague, uh, plague, then uh, uh, HIV, AIDS, then uh, other uh, COVID uh, viruses, coronaviruses, and latest is the COVID. And the, the every time it has stayed for years. It is not that it is going to finish in months. So the strategy should be such that we can deal with it, uh, with it uh, in the society. And uh, if you see the world uh, figures, they are too high. But China says we are only 82,000. God only knows who is truthful. And if you see the India and the United States, the number of cases and the deaths are running parallel. It is 90,000 new cases, uh, uh, total cases in India versus 90,000 deaths. So the situation you can uh, see it is immense. Lockdown is not the only answer. It only mitigates. That means it makes the disease supple in the community and limited clusters it happens and again it rises and it goes down but if we are able to do the mitigation then we might be able to do the normal surgeries as before uh, in the same uh, speed as we we're doing before now if you see the challenges for a cancer uh, patient the optimal care of a pathway of a cancer it stages, its stages are from one to three, four, as all we know. But there is also uh, recovery and rehabilitation, that is stage five. Stage six is when recurrences happen, and stage seven is end of life. So all this, along with the COVID, is a big challenge. And the oncology community is really fighting with it wholeheartedly with whatever modifications as you uh, heard uh, Dr. Parasar, so many modifications, and we are still continuing the treatment. For as regarding the surgery, the first uh, general surgery guideline came from the RCS UK, where they said only do emergent surgery, planned surgeries, hold on, uh, uh, except the curative surgery, all must have PPEs, the theater needs some changes, uh, laparoscopy, no to laparoscopy because body fluids, contain the virus and once you do laparoscopy, the chances of aerosolization, uh, aerosolization are quite high. And endoscopy is the most risky procedure because you are at the head end and you are dealing with the uh, mouth and the airway and the head, uh, the secretions contain uh, the viral load. So all these were challenges. And similarly, uh, in the uh, annals of internal medicine, uh, for the cancer patient, generally they were divided into low risk, where three months delay, uh, more than three months delay can happen, and uh, to the intermediate risk where three month delay will be okay, and uh, to the 
high risk where uh, you cannot delay, you have to immediately give the treatment. And uh, depending on the type of cancer like prostate, all can wait. And But if there is a colonic obstruction, it cannot wait, the surgery has to be done. Similarly, if you have a uh, like a pancreatic cancer, so there is no endo period. If you want to operate, you have to operate. And in some cases of invasive adenocarcinoma, new adjuvant has been tried and pushed to uh, a month or two, but till when? Till when? So we have to find a solution to enter the surgical operation theaters and do the surgeries. Otherwise, the patients are going to be uh, deprived of the optimal treatment of cancer surgery. So the uh, American College of uh, Surgery guidelines are very uh, clear and it is mostly followed all of India is that if the patient needs a appropriate surgical care, it should be given with proper uh, PPE and whatever changes you need in the uh, theater, uh, you have to uh, go for the surgical treatment. Otherwise, it is going to be a big problem that the person is not undergoing a curative surgery by which he can get prominent cure. But uh, definitely some of the surgeries can be avoided which uh, uh, should be avoided and aerosolization is a big challenge with the electrocautery. Uh, uh, all lot of gadgets are being used in the operation theater. So we have to find out some way, some way and the surgeon is the most uh, uh, vulnerable to infection. So you have to find ways to prevent him, to, to save him from having these uh, infections. So PPEs, FFPs like uh, uh, full face masks uh, uh, from uh, different companies, then uh, PAPR, respirators, N95 masks, they have all saved the surgeon. Similarly, the American College of Surgeons uh, has divided this whole COVID crisis into phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is semi-urgent, what we are going through now is that it is not an urgent setting. Uh, in semi-urgent, mostly we can do the, some of the curative surgeries, but definitely the whole load has become 30 to 40%, 60% of the surgeries are not happening because of the lockdown. There is a lot of uh, accessibility problem. And if the patients are coming, they are not convinced to undergo surgery because of the fear and all that. In the phase two is an urgent setting where ICU and ventilators are used for the COVID patients. And similarly, phase three is just a madras. Your whole hospital is occupied by COVID patients. You don't have theaters to run. You, have, you don't have anesthesis to run the so. So ultimately, it is going to cause the uh, delay. Similarly, all, in all the three phases, uh, type of breast cancer surgery that are to be done, which are uh, which are going to benefit in these three phases of uh, the COVID crisis have been pre pretty clearly described by the uh, ACA. Similarly, thoracic cancer, if you have a uh, more than two centimeter lung mass without any nodes, then what is the point of waiting? Well, whatever may be the risk, the patient is taking the risk, the surgeon is taking the risk, have all universal precaution and go ahead and do the surgery. Similarly, if you see the colorectal cancer, if somebody has come with a nearly obstructing colon cancer, will you wait? You cannot wait. And uh, a few days back, I my uh, uh, endoscopist was doing a, a, low, a colonoscopy and it got perforated. I had no other chance to take to the theater with full PPU operated. Uh, we resected the part and uh, the patient became all right. So these are all satisfying. Uh, in spite, in spite of taking the risk, if the patient is benefiting, why not? Other cancers like gynecological cancers, mostly if you see an ovarian cancer with a massive uh, ascites, give neurogenic chemotherapy, wait for some time, then that might, the COVID phase might go and you can do the surgery. But you have a curative stage one endometrial cancer, why not to operate? Because this is the only chance of window for cure for the person. You cannot de deprive them from uh, the surgical outcome that they are going to get. And if you see uh, during this period, the whole of the world, around 80 countries, this COVID surge is the uh, uh, study designed and immediately after announcement, 4,000 surgeons 
have joined. I'm also part of it in the uh, PI. And uh, the, if you see the uh, early results are out, I will tell you later uh, from Birmingham. Uh, but uh, if you, the, the all uh, every surgeon said that we will participate because uh, even if the patients are COVID positive, why not to operate and give the benefit to the patient because some are asymptomatic, 85% are having mild symptoms, then why to deprive them from the uh, surgery? Similarly, COVID surge cancer is cancer specific. COVID surge was for the general uh, surgeries, but COVID surge cancer is also uh, a specific study in which only cancer surgeries are included. Mostly, if the patient has seven history, prior history of positive COVID, or 30 days perioperative means after the surgery 30 days if he becomes positive the whole uh, 37 days positivity is taken as covid positive in all these uh, cancer surgery similarly in covid surge and uh, the definitely because as we are passing uh, through in india we have crossed 50 days and as we are passing through the days more surgeries will happen and definitely some result will come out of these studies now, if you see the Indian uh, Indian Surgical Society, Indian Association of Surgical Oncology, is the largest society serving the uh, whole of uh, Indian community, and it has got a clear guidelines, site-specific, individual, and with the updated modification as per the situation. It, it is going to change in India as uh, we are just in, entering the lockdown port. We will have one more modification after we hear the uh, the relaxations that we are going to get. Similarly, the inter-association guideline from uh, uh, IAGS, MRC, and the uh, CELSI, they are giving very clear cut guidelines for the laparoscopy, what modifications you do so that you can even do the laparoscopy procedures. So because we are entering the fourth phase, so we have to do the procedures. And ICMR uh, has also diluted the form by creating a, uh, another uh, criteria of others. So in the others category, we write cancer surgery and high risk and we sign, the doctor signs and the COVID testing is done in almost all cancer surgeries. It is not, no patient is taken without a COVID testing. Now, if you see there are 30%, 20 to 30% false negative. So should we, uh, uh, do the surgeries in negative patients without any PP, not, not a, to take a chance. We do uh, the uh, we do the complete PP even in negative patients. Because then the question was asked, why do you test when you uh, uh, are uh, taking universal precautions and spending a lot of money uh, in the PPs? The test is done only to segregate the patients to the proper COVID hospital because in India there is COVID hospitals declared. All hospitals are not COVID, so there is a specific COVID hospitals. Or in some places they have dedicated one portion of the hospital as COVID. So the COVID area, the there is a, a total the uh, SC system, the OT, everything is changed, totally changed with. Uh, lot of modifications so that these patients, even if COVID positive, can undergo proper uh, surgeries in the COVID theaters. So the idea of testing is both ways to know the uh, COVID positivity. And there was another uh, paper which said that antibody testing should be done because if somebody is seven to eight days after the uh, COVID uh, infection, it might turn negative, but the antibody test might be positive because the IgG and IgM will rise. So that is also true, but till now in India, we rely wholly on the RT-PCR. Antibody tests are not done, only is reserved for emergency surgeries in the night because in India, RT-PCR takes 24 hours for the result. But if you want to operate somebody in the night instantly, you can use the antibody test and if it comes negative, you take to the theater and do the surgery. So we are not at all utilizing 
the antibody test. This is very important because the for the surgeon, the only savior is the PPE. And the PPE, there are three levels, level one, level two, level three. Level one is only endoscopy and bronchoscopy. Level two, level three are for surgeries. And most of the uh, places they have level two, at least for level three at some specific uh, areas like COVID positive surgeries, we can go for level three, where multiple layers of PPEs are being, uh, are being worn. And the protection of the head and everything is more than N95 mask. Uh, and that, uh, to give example, these are level one, level two, and level three. So level three is mostly for completely COVID positive. But what we normally go to the for as a part of the universal, universal precaution is uh, level two. Now, when a patient comes, we first screen with the epidemiological history, travel history, contact history, history of uh, uh, fever, respiratory symptoms. Uh, we check whether COVID tested or not because we sometimes do from home. And uh, we segregate our wards into three categories. Cohort A is when the patient comes without, uh, if patient comes without any COVID testing, he will be kept in cohort A group. Code B is when uh, we have a, uh, evidence of code B, uh, COVID negative. Uh, a, when the code A becomes tested and negative, is moved to code B. And code C is the positive patient, uh, which are transferred as to the COVID positive hospitals, COVID hospitals or COVID floors. So that way we segregate the patient, the PO, pre-op worker, uh, workup definitely includes a COVID testing. HRCP of thorax helps both ways, metastatic, uh, excluding the metastasis. And also it helps in having any sign of uh, COVID, COVID uh, respiratory problems. Then antibody test, if available, some, some centers do both. And one of the government hospitals, what, what they do is their COVID test, COVID negative. Then they keep the patient for seven days in the ward as a watch, wait and watch policy because the, uh, they don't know that uh, when the patient was tested, whether it is a false negative. After seven days, they operate. But in private, it is difficult to keep the patients and uh, for their rising bills and routine preoperative testing and MDT decisions are in presence of a respiratory physician and an ICU physician because all the patients needs a clearance from the respiratory physician and the ICU physician. Cardiac and pulmonary clearance is definitely required and special so consent along with the normal operative consent is must because even if the patient visits your OPD or the IPD, a special COVID consent must be there where it says that during undergoing treatment, I might become COVID positive and I endorse that I don't blame neither the hospital nor the surgeon, anybody. So this type of special consent is being taken uh, so that the uh, surgeon is safe if post-operative by chance the person develops COVID positivity. And donning and doffing, now if this is part of surgeon's life, you have to be very meticulous at least during doffing because that is the where you have already had the exposure and you have just uh, uh, have to be very meticulous, spend 30 to 40 minutes to do a complete doffing stepwise to, so that you don't take the virus anywhere. And the new uh, gadgets, that is the FFM, the full face mask with a front seal, everything. And it is uh, almost like airtight. And you can see the surgeries, but the big problem is you cannot communicate. Because it is so airtight, you cannot, even if you speak, the in front person cannot listen. So what we do is only sign language. So if I need an instrument, only the sign language, and so this is required and this is required. So that is part of life for next COVID era. And there are a lot of OR changes required in a COVID positive OT, like negative pressure rooms, high frequency air changes, more than 25 cycles, preferably. HEPA filter OT should be there, but the SE inside the OT should have a control for on and off because during intubation and extubation, 20 minutes, the, it should be on and off. Now, 
uh, the special creation of the doning and uh, doffing area minimum or staff who are required no movements and new sterilization methods for the uh, gadgets that we use uh, although most are disposable but the uh, ffm mask they are all to be uh, to be uh, sterilized similarly the or strategy is first make everything prepared in the trolley before anybody comes then only the anesthetist comes and gives the anesthesia and there is no surgeon seen and after that from the doning area the surgeon enters and takes over so everything has to be stepwise well communicated and everybody with a pp preferably with a full face uh, mask for surgeons and half face masks are also available for the uh, anesthetist and also n95 is a very good with front seal uh, uh, protecting the secretions going onto your uh, face as a fomite but uh, uh, if you have the uh, option of using a full face mask nothing like it because there is no fogging that is the best way if in a front seal the fogging is a big problem so uh, the next is that during anesthesia only anesthesia team video laryngoscope to be used and the vinyl box is a very good uh, uh, box uh, being uh, created and that uh, separates uh, the hand goes inside the holes and the intubation is done so that no secretion comes to the uh, anesthetist and the et tube should be connected to a hme filter and so that uh, the secretion doesn't come through the et tube once the tube is in similarly same precautions to be uh, uh, done during the extubation so similarly if you see the mis the advantages are so many as uh, before less pain less hospital stay quick recovery small incidents but the concern is there is a port side leakage aerosolization of the body fluids chance of spread in the or environment to affect others and the modification in laparoscopy that should be done small port incisions exactly snugging the uh, trocars avoid the sudden uh, release of the carbon dioxide trocars with the unilateral valve so there is no uh, chance of any accident carbon dioxide uh, pneumoperitoneum has to be through special uh, insufflators i will describe later then smoke evacuator is uh, through the filtration system is a important component now and right instrument through right, right side ports that means 5 mm port instrument should not be put in 8 mm port because there will be leakage so if you see the energy devices we use harmonic pottery the ligasure bone cutting devices all generate huge aerosols so that is why we are taking all precautions they all should be sucked through a ultrafiltration system and pneumoperitoneum should be desufflated through a dedicated separate uh, trocar now the convert air seal system is a very good system for it has all the modes like uh, uh, air seal the uh, standard pneumoperitoneum uh, method and the uh, smoke evacuator so this is the best uh, that we can have in the theater but other companies have also uh, uh, smoke evacuators like if you see the smoke uh, daily uh, a, a surgeon has uh, is smokes around 30 unfiltered cigarettes with the cautery and all the gadgets it uses but nobody realized this before so most of the theater should be having uh, the uh, smoke evacuators covidin and ethicon both have rapid vac and mega vac they are very good smoke evacuator but uh, in india we always do what is called a jugad jugad is that we do something to uh, spend less cost for our peripheral surgeons even we use it that for the pneumo peritoneum evacuation we use a separate trocar with a uh, uh, with a uh, catheter connected to a water seal hypochlorite chloride solution whether it is a water seal thoracic drainage bag or you can have a water seal uh, bottle with a half filled hypochlorite and all your secret pneumo peritoneum can be deflated through a specific uh, extra trocar into that so that will uh, make all the secretions going 
uh, all the pneumoperitoneum going into the hypochloride solution and the virus becomes dead. And similarly, for all the success ma suction machines in the theater, we use the double bottle suction machines. One bottle is filled with the hypochlorite. Whatever body secretions you aspirate during the surgery, it goes into the other bottle and uh, that sterilizes your uh, uh, viruses. So uh, this I found yesterday only, the loss of surgeries from the same COVID group, uh, which is reported elective surgery cancellations, 560 hospitals, 60 countries, 28.4 million surgeries are lost. They are not performed uh, in three months, uh, 90 days uh, time. Because during this time, the uh, multifactorial, the patient could not come and surgeries are lost. So uh, this is uh, like a site specific, but around 35 to 40% of the surgeries are related to cancer. So if you see the number of surgeries related to cancer, around 40% of the cancer surgeries are not being performed. So I always ask, are we doing it right? So we should be well prepared and enter our theaters, then deprive the patients of the uh, proper uh, surgery, uh, surgical outcome. So COVID will come and go, but the ultimate fear and stigma will stay. So the answer is we have to deal with it. So in conclusion, worldwide cancer surgeries have decreased. Depending on the pandemic pattern of spread, individualization of treatment method with each cancer, and uh, country specific and type of uh, uh, surgeries to be performed can be decided. And the treatment modifications will definitely help a lot of cancer patients. And uh, COVID RT-PCR is must in all cancer surgeries to be undertaken with special COVID consent. And a PPE, FFM, N95 mask, smoke evacuator, air seal are our saviors in COVID times. With that, I thank and my final message is maximize suspicion and precaution, minimize patient hospitalization and clinical interaction with the patients. Use video consults for the follow-up and even if the patient comes, do everything in your chamber before the patient is interacted and after the interaction and make minimum interaction with the patient in your OPD chambers. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I think our next speaker is our uh, uh, medical oncologist. Uh, she will be taking on uh, the next uh, talk. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I will be talking about COVID and cancer from a medical oncologist perspective. So obviously, you know, we've spoken about uh, the novel coronavirus, scientifically called uh, the systemic acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 which has caused the COVID infection, it has become, you know, nobody would argue against this, the most important uh, challenge that we have all been facing. Um, and I think this will be the most important challenge that we would probably face throughout our entire lives. As of yesterday, um, over 4.5 million confirmed cases worldwide, um, including 1.5 million cases in the United States alone. Uh, accounting for about 300,000 plus deaths worldwide and about 90,000 in the United States. So um, we know that now that um, the virus could potentially affect any individual, all ages, but we also know that there are certain individuals who are at higher risk, older individuals, patients with underlying health conditions, We've come to recognize that you know the common ones are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, pulmonary disorders, hypertension. They seem to be more vulnerable to uh, infection and to develop a more severe illness. 
But we should not forget cancer because um, you know our patients are uh, probably the most vulnerable and uh, the highest risk uh, population. But I think that the, the topic here is how is this pandemic uh, affecting cancer care from, from a medical oncologist perspective? And what do medical oncologists need to know um, about um, you know, taking care of these patients? So the objectives are how does can cancer influence the susceptibility to COVID-19 and its complications? What lasting impacts will this pandemic have on cancer treatment? How is this pandemic um, specifically affecting cancer care? And how do clinicians need to know, um, what, uh, what do clinicians need to know when they are providing care to these patients? affected with COVID-19 and have cancer at the same time. So impact of cancer on COVID care. So we've heard that depending on the geographic locations of where you are, uh, there may be a decline or even complete cessation of cancer screening programs, delays in curative treatments. Um, we just uh, heard from uh, the surgeons and uh, the radiation oncologist, and also diagnostic procedures, staging procedures, things that we were used to as standard of care, interruptions or delays in initiation of chemotherapy and radiation, impact on treatment planning. Um, we're coming up with uh, you know treatment strategies that are somewhat evidence-based, but that's definitely was not considered standard of care before this pandemic, uh, that are tailored to decrease visits to infusion center and minimize complications from COVID-19. Uh, there's been impact on follow-up visits. There's been a lot of rescheduling going on behind the scenes. I thank uh, my nurses, my uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, um, and my um, uh, the medical secretaries who are rescheduling patients. And we're pouring through the list of our patients, trying to see who can be um, delayed uh, for a follow-up visit and, and converting a lot of visits to telemedicine. So it's important to keep tabs of all the patients that we rescheduled so that when we are able to um, bring them back, we need to have accounting for all of them. Uh, and, and, la and I think another important aspect is isolation of patients in treatment areas and hospital rooms. They're not allowed to bring guests like they were before. So there's a, a great impact on mental health. Um, patients, uh, uh, you know, they're sick, they go to the hospital, they awaken to um, a, a completely alien environment with people around them in, in different gears. It's very, uh, it's a very scary experience for these patients. And I think um, it, it's important to recognize the effect on mental health. Testing of symptomatic and asymptomatic cancer patients, uh, when do you uh, do that? And, um, and do you do that for every patient who's uh, planned to start cancer treatments? Do we have enough kits? Uh, I think a lot of it depends on the incidence of cases <clears throat> in a particular geographic area, availability of the kits, and uh, the relative risk of, uh, or the relative uh, um, risk of uh, possible infection. So uh, there's also impact uh, on, of cancer diagnosis in treating potentially uh, positive patients or seriously ill COVID-19 patients. Um, patients who are suffering from both an advanced cancer diagnosis and at the same time a very severe COVID illness. There we have to triage uh, the ventilators. We have to triage the ICU beds. I think that puts us, put, puts us at the position of making decisions or discussing with family members with patients about goals of uh, care uh, and doing that preemptively before the patient goes to the hospital is, is really an important aspect. Uh, we know that um, now that there's higher lethality from COVID-19 in immunocompromised patients, um, particularly in this case, patients who are receiving chemotherapy or cancer, um, in some, some cancers itself can cause immunocompromised status. So uh, COVID-19 and complications. Are patients with cancer more prone to develop complications? So, well, as expected, we do have the first data from the Wuhan um, province in China where um, the, the pandemic first hit. Um, and, and in one of the papers, uh, about um, 1,500 plus patients uh, with cancer were admitted to an oncology department over a six-week period. 
from December to February, and they noted that a 0.79% of patients were infected with uh, COVID-19 compared to community uh, infection rate of 0.37%. But, you know, um, this really was not, they didn't really look at uh, the, in the community setting, these are patients that were admitted to the hospital. But it was important to note that all these patients were sick enough to be admitted. And other studies, uh, a few other studies from China, note an incidence or prevalence rate of one to two percent. In um, in our institute, uh, paper uh, paper that came out of our institution, six percent of our fifty seven hundred hospitalized patients had cancer. In Italy, eight percent of uh, fifteen hundred plus patients admitted to ICU had um, active cancer. And I think the most, um, you know, the significant impact of cancer on COVID-19 mortality comes from Italy, where 20% of deaths from COVID-19 um, in all of Italy had active cancer. This is a very busy slide. I really don't want to belabor you in, 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 into de discussing the details, but I do want to mention that in this particular um, study from Wuhan, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, a lot of patients had non-small cell lung cancer. So lung cancer is something that, you know, um, spe uh, specifically discussed in uh, most of these talks because it seems to be a particular risk factor uh, among solid malignancies for COVID-19 complications. Um, so, is the illness, the next question is, uh, is the illness more severe in patients with cancer? I think this, this graphic representation from um, a paper in China uh, is, is really very helpful in, in giving us that information. So these are patients without any history of cancer here on the left-hand side. Um, these are patients who have um, are all hospitalized or are in ICUs. And when you see patients with uh, uh, cancer survivors, the incidence increases. Patients with active cancer have the highest rate of infection um, and uh, complications. So this, I think this, this graphic format, I think represents, tells us exactly how um, the cancer diagnosis impacts the, the severity of COVID infection in cancer patients. Again, this is a swimmer's plot showing um, the timelines of uh, events in COVID-19 patients. On the left-hand side, it's with cancer, and on the right-hand side is uh, patients without cancer. And you can see that all the timelines are delayed. The recovery is delayed in patients with cancer. There was higher ICU admission rates, higher um, intubation rates, and higher mortality from COVID-19 uh, when patients have cancer compared to those without cancer. So this is also a busy slide, but I think um, these are important cancers, lung cancer, GI cancers, blood cancers. These are the ones that we really commonly see in, in patients who are being admitted and patients who are admitted to the ICU and patients who, have, um, who, who die from COVID-19. So again, in, in summary, is illness more severe in patients with um, cancer? So 67 out of 218 patients, this is a typo, it's 28% uh, of COVID positive patients died um, when they had a concurrent cancer diagnosis with a case fatality rate of 37% for hematologic malignancies and 25% for solid malignancies. 55% of lung cancer patients died from COVID-19. So that's definitely, again, um, you know, highlighting the diagnosis of lung cancer in these patients as a potential or uh, particular risk factor. We know, as in other conditions, older age, com multiple comorbidities, need for ICU support, elevated D-dimers, LDH, lactate, are risk factors that should be looked at as risk factors for uh, COVID-19 as you would do for any other patients. From, from New York, there have been a few papers um, that have been published in JAMA lately. In the first one um, from Mata et al., this is a Montefiore data, where uh, that, the one that I just presented was from Montefiore. The next one is from Mount Sinai, where 6% of patients uh, 
out of all the patients that were diagnosed with COVID-19 had cancer. Most of them had breast cancer, prostate cancer, followed by lung. I mean, it really depends on the geographic location and the type of patients that are drawn into these hospitals. But it is important to note that the, the consistent message is that cancer patients seem to be at a higher risk for severe illness and for complications from COVID-19. Older the patients, higher the risk of getting intubated. And for, for, for some particular reason in this particular uh, paper, patients under the age of 50 had higher mortality rate uh, if they had cancer compared to those who did not have cancer. So sort of understandable, again, these are all observation studies. Can we draw any conclusions from all of this? These are real, this is really just data sharing. And I think um, all that it, it tells us is that cancer diagnosis has a huge impact on uh, COVID-19 um, risk factor, I mean, COVID-19 uh, complications. So uh, we, we heard a lot about testing, um, how when do we test, uh, who are the patients that need to be tested. Do we uh, test patients who have only COVID-19 symptoms or a, a definite known COVID-19 exposure? Taking history, epidemiological history, the, the travel history is all important, but all it amounts to is the, the number of testing kits available, um, the incidents in a particular geographic area. We are sitting at the epicenter, and I think um, you know um, uh, everyone knows that New York is really the hub right now, um, and uh, for for the COVID nineteen infection. So, um, testing of all patients receiving immunosuppressive therapy has been recommended by various guidelines, including the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, but uh, again, everything uh, boils down to whether we have the testing kits and uh, uh, we have the ability, the personnel to do that. When do you check and how frequently do we check? Because this is, uh, you know, this is an ongoing pro process. Patients may be negative today and may acquire the infection in the next couple of weeks. How frequently do you check them? And logistics, where should it be done? Should it be done at the infusion center? Uh, should it be done at a, an outpatient location? Or should it be done, some places have even set up tents in front of uh, the infusion centers to do the testing. Um, and what about the serological testing? Um, I don't think that was uh, discussed uh, in other um, and in other by other speakers, but I think you know the serological testing is uh, is gaining speed. What does that mean? Uh, does it mean that patients who have antibodies have uh, immunity and therefore they sh they should be treated like any other patient? We still do not know that. Um, cancer treatment for those who test positive, again, that, that also brings us to the next question as to when do we start treatment on them? Do we hold treatment? Um, I think there are some exceptions. Uh, oral drugs, ibrutinib, for example, just not need to be held uh, for patients who test positive COVID unless they are very sick and in the ICU. Um, same things with the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors for lung cancer. Uh, but in general, I think, you know, we all agree that when patients test positive for COVID-19, we do not bring them to the infusion suite to give um, the treatment. Usually, uh, we, they need to test uh, negative uh, at least one time. The CDC goes another step ahead and says two um, FDA authorized tests, uh, PCR tests should be done 24 hours apart, and they should both be negative before we bring the patients back to the infusion center to uh, receive treatment. And I think I spoke uh, about earlier, there's an um, uh, ethical dilemma, critically ill advanced cancer patients. Um, you know, what is our role there, goals of uh, care discussions? Uh, and it's really very helpful to have medical order for life-sustaining treatment, most forms and post forms already, uh, having had this discussion prior to admission uh, with the patient directly would go a long way in making um, helpful. So uh, in, in general, the general care, it's important to educate patients, uh, I think, to, to, uh, trying to deliver a uniform message. They hear um, the, the, I think, uh, the, the news channels are really, I mean, it's, it, they, re, they hear about this from various channels. There's a lot of fear 
uh, without much facts. And I think it's important for us to educate our patients about proper techniques, you know, what they need to do, the masking and washing hands and, and, and visitations, et cetera. It's, it's really a lot of education that goes into it. Limit visits to facility, uh, obviously no visitors, postpone procedures whenever safely possible. And, uh, you know, in our institution, we have this policy of uh, avoiding providers from cross coverage of hospital and infusion center. We have a, a COVID heavy hospital setting and um, the infusion center, we really, you know, really, we don't have, we allow patients um, into the infusion center if we suspect COVID. So we don't want providers to cross-contaminate between the hospital and the infusion center. Uh, Pre-screening via telephone uh, calls or digital platforms for COVID-19 symptoms and exposure prior to coming into the clinic and in the clinic, um, there, there are people stationed in the front checking temperatures and taking travel histories and, and histories of uh, uh, possible infection. So any screening procedures, elective surgeries, like we discussed earlier, um, should be postponed unless uh, the geographic area can facilitate that. There's adequate resources, hospital beds, uh, personnel, uh, PPEs, and testing ability. There is, and I think this brings us, to, uh, you know, really, I think the virtual platforms have been great uh, in, and I hope they will stay beyond this pandemic. We've learned so much uh, during this pandemic about how to communicate with, with each other uh, through this virtual platform. Virtual tumor boards, uh, who patient and I, um, we attend the head and neck tumor board um, on, a, on a regular basis. And I think it's really important to put the entire uh, groups thinking into into picture because we cannot do certain things like we used to do uh, in the pre-pandemic era. And uh, we are using evidence-based neoadjuvant therapies for some cases, for example, cisplatin pemetrexate for stage two, stage three resectable lung um, cancers, a neoadjuvant hormonal treatment for early stage breast cancer or, or high-risk prostate cancer. Um, there are several questions around starting systemic anti-cancer treatment. There's really no data to say that we should delay or withhold chemotherapy or immunotherapy in patients with cancer unless they're infected or have a high risk for infection. Uh, in the adjuvant curative setting, I think it's, it's clear that you know, we should go ahead uh, without any compromise uh, for curative uh, intent treatments, but then what about in metastatic setting? And what about in patients who are doing really well in, in deep remission and they're really just on maintenance therapy? A lot of it also uh, depends on the age of the patient, their comorbid conditions, where they're, the geographic location um, and options, and if there are any options for non-cytotoxic uh, therapy, if the patients are on combination treatments with immunotherapy and Chemotherapy, uh, dropping the chemotherapy while continuing the immunotherapy might be an option. Um, and altering the treatment schedule. Thankfully, there are some changes that have happened very rapidly uh, through FDA, like for example, um, uh, increasing the, uh, or, or um, spacing out the treatment of pembrolizumab from every three weeks to every six weeks uh, is an option now, and that we have adapted that very easily in our clinic. What about supportive factors, growth factors? Uh, we usually provide growth factor, myeloid growth factors, uh, or you know, um, uh, filbrastimin, PEC filbrastimin. The risk for neutropenia is about 20% or more. But now, even if it's 10%, we are offering that. What about corticosteroids? Um, I think you know, there's still debate about that. But if they need the patients need it, we'll still continue that. We are not bringing in patients for genosumab, bisphosphonates, for bone metastases, just, just if they're just receiving that, if they're not coming into the infusion suite just to get that. And uh, like I said, um, elective advanced care uh, planning goes a long way when patients get admitted. And um, uh, like Dr. Parashar mentioned, I think the role of psycho-oncology is really huge, both to help patients and providers get through this um, big challenge. Um, I'm not going to go into this, um, uh, Dr. Acharya went into the details, but I'm a thoracic oncologist, so I just wanted to bring to, um, to your attention the importance, and, and we were, or as I said, we were in the heavy COVID zone, so a lot of uh, things that we used to do in the past, you know, multiple, multiple floors were converted into COVID floors. Uh, most of the surgical units were uh, taken over by um, by. COVID floors and the thoracic surgeons and anesthesiologists were deployed to cover um, the COVID uh, the ICUs as well as uh, um, 
with COVID floors. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, elective surgeries have, have uh, completely uh, halted. And now that we are starting to see a decline in, in the new cases, you know, we are, fa we are ready to face the next challenge, which is a rapid influx of new cases. That's where we are headed. And I think that would be the next topic of the next uh, few discussions as to how we are going to handle the huge volume of new cancer diagnosis. Uh, most patients who are going to be um, advanced in, in, the, in the upcoming weeks to come. So I will end here. Thank you for this great, uh, great opportunity. And I think uh, together with my other two speakers, I'm ready to take on the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nagashree. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. I have a few questions. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I, I got some questions from the audience. And let me just read out the questions to you. One question is, uh, I think Dr. Acharya can answer that. So the question is, I think you mentioned it, and the question was asked before that, but still, if you could just uh, summarize what PPEs uh, are being used by the surgeons when they are operating. Yeah. So PPE is personal protective equipment. It includes a three-ply surgical mask, N95, and the PPE kits are available uh, in level one, level two, level three, complete kit with a goggles, front shield, and there is a uh, overall that means it completely covers your body along with the hood, and it has two shoe covers. So the PPE kit is very easily available at any place uh, throughout India, even uh, in most of the countries. And it is being uh, used um, at the donning and the doffing, uh, donning area. So the specific area where you are going to don and doff, that has to be identified. And donning and doffing should take time and you should cover all parts of your body because anywhere there is a exposed part, then chances of this aerosolization and creating a fomite. So best is to cover every part of your body and then enter the theater. So that is what is called as a PP. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for uh, Dr. Sitaramu. If there is an IV treatment going on uh, at this time, should we change it to oral? Uh, so the question I think is for chemotherapy. If there's an IV chemotherapy, do we need to change it to oral regimens or, or not? I think it's a case by case situation. I mean, it depends on the availability of an oral uh, substitute. I mean, I think in, in case of uh, five of you, I think it's easy to substitute with uh, Cape cytopene. Uh, but, you know, in patients receiving IV chemotherapy for, let's say, for lung cancer, there's really no, I mean, and, and if they do not have any driver mutations, there's not much of data to, you know, I mean, what are we going to switch them to? There's, it kind of depends on the disease and available options. Okay. Thank you so much. This is very helpful. I have a question for uh, Dr. Acharya. So, which surgical procedures are at a high, you mentioned endoscopy is at a very high risk of uh, uh, transmitting infection. But other than endoscopy, what surgical procedure? Because we know peritoneal fluid is uh, can be infected and maybe pleural fluid. Which surgical procedures are, are at highest risk, or do you or do you think all surgical procedures are at the same risk? No, uh, all surgical procedures are at, are at high risk, but uh, in open surgery the risk is less. When you are doing laparoscopic surgeries like uh, laparoscopic colorectal surgery, laparoscopic uh, distal pancreatectomy, whatever you are doing, you are taking sufficient time. That is number one, around three hours, uh, any uh, good surgical procedure requires. And plus, you are doing laparoscopy. So when the carbon dioxide starts moving in the abdomen for the pneumon peritoneum, the body fluids starts aerosolizing inside the abdomen. And whenever there is a leak, then it comes out to the theater. So that is why all these air seal, uh, vacuosa, uh, then the mega uh, vac, all these are meant only to avoid these uh, accidents. And they are being internalized, uh, filtered, and sucked out. And if we can mm, create a negative pressure OT, then the chances of aerosolization is less. So all these modifications are to be done because 
everybody was thinking covid will come and go in 3 months why to spend money to uh, change the theaters now the scenario is totally changed it is going to stay for years so if it is going to be stay for years we have to do all the changes in order because you cannot prevent surgical outcomes of such patients for years you can delay maximum by 3 months with whatever radiotherapy chemotherapy alternatives but beyond after 3 months what so why not now so my question is if we think that if this is going to stay minimum for a year till the vaccine comes and starts uh, killing the virus before that let us not give deprive our cancer patient the outcomes so even if there is a money to be spent it is worth spending the surgeon all need to uh, have proper uh, risk protection and to do the surgeries accordingly thank you so much this is very helpful uh, dr sitaram i have a question and maybe i'll ask you first and maybe uh, dr acharya if he needs to pitch in uh, what's the role of echo in your cancer patients in covid-19 pandemic so i'm not sure if you actually use echo to decide some of your chemotherapy regimens and uh, if you do are you doing that that's a question one of the audience members have asked uh all the imaging procedures um if, if, yeah, i mean i i for the regimens that i use there's lesser need for echocardiogram but uh, for hematological conditions before use of adromycin you know if if an echocardiogram is required patients are getting it without any with, without any issues um you, you know the imaging center has been open without any um there's been no delays the only delays are with regards to screening procedures um and i think uh, unless you know if, if patients are on follow up and we need to scan the image them we're moving images from let's say from 3 months to 6 months if they're clinically doing okay but other than that i don't think there's been a huge impact on any types of imaging procedures i see dr acharya any, any addition uh, i don't know how much echo plays in yeah uh, in i think for young patients we don't do but uh, if a patient is undergoing major uh, supra major cancer surgery like uh, esophagus pancreas whipples which are 5 to 6 hour surgeries then we might do echo if the person is above 55 years of years of age so there is a specific indication definitely i see thank you so and dr sitaram i have a question which chemo regimens uh, can are probably put the patient at a higher risk of being hospitalized and that's a common question being asked and are you avoiding those regimens or what are you doing uh, which chemo regimens are uh, are put the patient at a higher risk of hospitalization so any time i think you have a myelosuppressive treatment um you're at a higher risk for getting hospitalized um so um you know we're preemptively using growth factors for even like i said when the risk for neutropenia is about 10% we're using growth factors but nevertheless i think let me just speak about the head and neck cancer which we see frequently the regimen of tpf or you know um the, the docetaxel uh, platinum and five of you is is you know it's really uh, very difficult for patients to to handle there's a high risk for admission there's a high risk for neutropenia i mean i'm not using that um have you i've substituted that we've done a lot of new in uh, new adjuvant induction type of treatments in this uh, covid era and we recently substituted that with platinum paclitaxel and pembrolizumab based on phase 3 data uh for uh, advanced um cancer so we're kind of bringing metastatic regimens into the new uh, new adjuvant space to avoid uh, risk uh, for covid complications and admissions so that's one example Uh, but there are several examples like that and i think even again going back to head and neck um if there are patients who have uh, intermediate risk factor other than positive margins or extra capsular extension um previously there were considerations you know if the margin was closed or if the multiple lymph nodes we used to discuss chemotherapy you know if there are no hard indications for chemo you know definitely this is the time not to experiment uh, that on the patient if there's any possibility to avoid additional damage from chemo i think we take the opportunity of that 
we discuss this with patients at the, at the shared decision making and making sure that they understand that some of the treatment options have changed just because of COVID, um, you know, um, uh, the COVID pandemic. And Dr. Uh, like Dr. Acharya mentioned, I think it's important to get an umbrella consent from patients so that they understand that some of the treatment regimens have changed just because of the crisis. And it's for their safety. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I can. Okay, so one question is, what about uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors? There's a lot of, uh, day, uh, you know, concern uh, rather um, or speculation about Im immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, there, there are two um, schools of thought, I mean, theories rather. The first one was perhaps it will help improve the immunity and, and maybe it will help patients, um, you know, get more immune support to, to uh, fight off the infection. And on the flip side, there's also concern that, you know, the immune, immune, immunotherapy might increase the, cytos, uh, the cytokine storm in patients who are very sick. And I don't think we have support to say that either of these options are accurate. So based on our data, based on data that's emerging from other institutions, uh, we have not seen an increase in incidence of uh, infection or uh, complications from COVID-19 uh, with uh, with immunotherapy, nor a decrease. So I think you know it's it's a it's a manageable regimen with very little you know sa um, uh, risk for infection and or putting the patients into hospital. So we're really doing it as um, as per standard of care, but just trying to space it out as much as possible based on um, available guidelines. I think uh, we lost Dr. Parasha. Yeah, we lost. Thank you. Okay, so maybe um, uh, while he's trying to come in, um, let's um, see if there are any more. Um, oh, there you yeah, go. Sorry, so I just got disconnected. I think uh, I think we are done with the questions. Uh, let me just take one last look uh, uh, for Dr. Acharya. I think I had one question: uh, the delay in biopsies. How much do you think the delay in biopsies and diagnosis? has impacted uh, cancer care, just that delay in biopsies? No, I don't think except the deep laryngeal biopsies, all the biopsies are being done at present. Even uh, for, uh, for the bronchoscopy and upper GI scopy, like I mentioned, the vinyl pl plastic boxes have been created and that allows uh, the, with the proper protection of PPE, the only thing is it has to be equivalent to the surgical uh, protection and the endoscopies, uh, whether it is GI endoscopy biopsy or colonoscopic biopsy, because in feces also a lot of viral loads have been reported. So colonoscopic biopsy, upper GI scopy biopsy, bronchoscopic biopsy, then uh, uh, like uh, uh, the laryngoscopic biopsy, so all are being done. I don't think we have delayed the only problem is patient feels that if i go there is a fear and stigma that patient feels if i go to the hospital i might catch covid and come back so in india you know the stigma how it runs in, uh, in the community so that is also uh, that was my last slide actually we have to fight the stigma more than the covid actually thank you this is helpful very helpful uh, question to both uh, Dr. Sitaramo and Dr. Acharya. Should RT-PCR testing be proposed to all patients undergoing surgery or radiation? Again, I can ask, talk about radiation part, but I'll start with Dr. Sitaramo. Are you recommending RT-PCR uh, for all patients who are undergoing chemotherapy? And then I'm going to ask Dr. Acharya regarding surgery. Yeah, I think I alluded that uh, in, in one of my slides. Um, it, it really depends on the testing capabilities of the center, the testing kits available. Um, I think we are going that way. So far, we have only uh, reserved it for patients who have symptoms or who are in close contact with uh, potential cases, patients who come from nursing homes, from assisted living facilities or independent living facilities where there's really high risk for a possible infection, we mandate the testing. Uh, but I think going forward, perhaps I think uh, we will be looking at universal testing or uniform testing on all patients. 
Dr. Acharya, regarding surgery, are, are you proposing everyone should be tested if possible? Yeah, as per our guidelines from the ISO, Indian Institute of Surgical Oncology, we are doing in every patient. And uh, the testing uh, capabilities in India for the centers in, uh, because the highest concentration is in Mumbai, Delhi, and Gujarat. And all the three places, we have very good facilities. And uh, we do almost uh, uh, for all the patients. But we get the results on third day because also the private hospitals are getting the load from the government for the samples. So we are getting the result on the third day. By that time, we prepare the patient like uh, all other uh, uh, parameters required for the surgery, uh, cardiac clearance, pulmo clearance, MDT discussion, proper consenting, everything we do. And after that, when the result comes, because it is not that we are not going to do the surgery in the patient but to divide them into the groups so that they are in the COVID floor or non-COVID floor or are referred to a COVID hospital because Max Group has four hospitals in Delhi. They have dedicated one hospital in the Delhi to the uh, COVID hospital. So whatever positive patient comes from all the other centers, they are taken in the ambulance to the COVID hospital, everything, surgery, whatever. Uh, maybe the department, the patient is undergoing treatment. The all the uh, all the departments are there available uh, in the same hospital, and everybody is taken care just like a normal person. And what if RT PCR becomes positive? Then what do you do? Yeah, that is why RT PCR. If negative, we treat, and if positive, then it gets shifted to the COVID hospital. COVID floor. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question is, uh, which I got from an audience member is, if the patient has recovered from COVID infection, this is for Dr. Acharya, if the patient has recovered, do you think uh, the risk is less if you operate at that time or the risk remains or what do you think? Yeah, we recovered? give 28 days from the date of testing. From the date of testing, we give 28 days time. That is four weeks. After that, it's fit like a normal human being. No problem. Uh, I got a question uh, from radiation. It's been seen that when one deals with radiation, mutations are caused by radiation itself. How do you manage or control the intensity of therapeutic radiation? Has this uh, been reported to doctor? As I don't understand the last line, but again, mutations are caused by therapeutic radiation. However, uh, we do have standard doses that we use uh, for uh, a psychocidal effect, and we try to maintain those doses. It, yes, it does cause mutations, but the the implication of each mutation caused by radiation may show up later, may not show up. That research is still going on. Uh, so I cannot say, oh, if I'm giving radiation, mutations are caused by radiation, and so do I change my radiation dose if that's the question? I don't. Uh, we have a specific doses that we prescribe for specific uh, outcomes, and we, we follow those guidelines. Another question is, where can we see recent guidelines by IASO, uh, Interna Indian uh, Association of Surgical Oncology? For Dr. Acharya, where can we see them? Is there a journal? Yeah, uh, is it, it is in the website, www.iaso.com. There are two PDF files and uh, data with modifications, and we are going for our next modification very soon. I think these are all the questions that I have. Thank you, Dr. Sitaramo, Dr. Acharya. Fantastic presentations, very informative, and I loved it myself. I just heard so much, and uh, it was great to hear your perspective. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.